Stanford University. My name is Liang Ming. Uh, I'm the managing director for Bits and Watts Initiative and also runs the NASIO Alliance uh, for the School of Sustainability. So we are doing the uh, final session for today. And uh, as a moderator, I want to say we save the best for the last. As a host, I cannot see that. Every panel is great, it's the best. <laughs> and uh, so I have uh, uh, three goals uh, for this session. The first one is really reflect and repeat the five project goals that Inej mentioned in the beginning of the day. Then the second goal I have, we have this wonderful consortium. We have 16 universities, four national laboratories, two industry consortiums working together on this initiative. This is just a starting point. We are not building the stuff from scratch. You know, we have this initiative because we have great foundations there. So I want to discuss with my panelists really what we have done in the past, lay down the foundation for the earnest. That's the second goal I have. The third goal is really about talk about what is expected fundamental research we are going to do for earnest, which support the five goals we have for this project. So I would encourage everybody to think about it and to carry your question and ask us questions to engage on this conversation. So join me today from the right to the left. We have Jeff Daigle, Chief Engineer of Pacific, West, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Professor Priya Dandi, Assistant Professor at MIT and also the co-founder of Climate Change AI. Professor Jim McCarty from Iowa State University. And Associate Professor Ram Rajakoba from Silver Engineering Department of Stanford University. So my first question to all the panelists is really want to share with, give you opening remark, share with all the audience what you have done, your organization or consortium have done in the past, which helped Ernest have this great foundation so we can start with. So I will start with Jeff. You know, Jeff and I worked uh, almost 10 years ago on the Green Modernization uh, Consortium together for a long time on both operational side and also the planning side. And uh, he has been involved in many National Academy reports. Some of you, some of the reports you have seen the first slides of Inish, uh, Inish produced this morning. And uh, also you part of the team for the 2003 blackout investigation. So you involve a lot of national efforts regarding the reliability and the resilience. So could you please share with us what lessons we learned in the last 20 or 30 years for the national efforts in this area. I took some notes. Um, yeah, thank you, Liang. Uh, it's been great uh, collaborating with, with you and the rest of the team. So I, I did want to hit a couple of high points. Um, so Liang mentioned that there's been a few national academies um, study reports that have been uh, done in the past that are pertinent to some of this research. Uh, the first one I'll mention briefly is uh, in 2016, uh, there was a report on analytic research foundations for the next generation electric grid. And that included uh, some recommendations about uh, algorithm work. Also pointed out the need for open source uh, software development. And so that ties in very nicely with the NARM effort that JP talked about earlier. Um, and data, you know, and that's been a recurring theme throughout the whole day. And one of the things that that report talked about is, is maybe the use of synthetic data for doing some of the uh, analysis or algorithm d development that could be then transferred. You could transfer the algorithms to industry, but test it in the academic world with, with the synthetic data. And one of the uh, chairs of that study committee was uh, Dr. Tom Overby, and he's really been working on developing these synthetic data sets. The next one I'll mention is the Resilience Report, and this came out in 2017. The cover was, was on the earlier slides this morning that Lang mentioned. And this uh, report really dug into uh, resilience. It pointed out the ways that resilience and reliability, that even though they're related, they're very different concepts. And it talked about recommendations for enhancing uh, the nation's uh, uh, resilience. And I can get into some of those recommendations, but I'll just point out a few quick examples. You know, one thing is architecture to reduce the criticality of, of um, key components. And one of the, the study authors, uh, uh, Terry Boston, who, who ended his career before he retired at the, uh, as the CEO of PGM, 
he had a saying that the best way to secure a critical substation is to not have any critical substations, <laughs> right? And so, uh, so there's things you can do architecturally to, to improve the resilience. We also had a whole chapter on cyber, and one of the key findings of that was cyber resilience. And there's a lot of people that are interested in cybersecurity, making sure that the systems uh, you know, are, are protected against adversaries and, and that sort of thing. But cyber resilience is a deeper concept than that. How many utilities have, have a real black start capability to bring up their, their cyber systems if they've been compromised? And, and so when you do have a major uh, cyber incident, recovering from that can really be painful if you don't have the, the practice and the tools for that. Uh, there's a whole section on, on distributed energy resources. And I think DER is a real fascinating thing to think about in the context of resilience. In the early days of DER deployment, and again, a lot of that was, was really led out of California with some of the, the early um, rules that utilities had for integrating DER into the system. And what you wanted to do is get the DER tripped off quickly if there's a system disturbance for, for safety reasons. You don't want to be back feeding into the, to the um, feeder if there's line crews out there restoring the system. And once you get past a certain amount of uh, DER deployment, which is where we are now, the current IEEE standards, talk about ride-through capability. You don't want to trip off quickly. You want to ride through allow the protection schemes to, to operate, but otherwise stay on and, and ride through the disturbance. Where we need to go next with DER is, is using these resources as a building block for bringing the system back on, islanding during an emergency, helping with black start restoration, that sort of thing. We're not quite there yet with those sta standards. Um, so there's a number of, of those types of things that are in that report. It also talked about some non-technical things in there as well. Um, earlier today, we were talking about metrics, and, and I really liked um, uh, Gene's comments about, you know, it's, it's not only what you can measure, but what you can model, which is great. Um, but one of the things that this um, Academy's report talked about is how do we pay for resilience? Reliability is paid for with ratepayers. And resilience, it, because of the societal benefit of having a resilient infrastructure, Maybe a blend of ratepayer and taxpayer-funded uh, initiatives might make sense. And there's precedent for that. You know, when you look at after Superstorm Sandy, the state of New Jersey put in a few billion dollars to help improve the resilience of their critical infrastructures. Um, and there's many, many examples where governments have done grants. You know, there's current, a GRIP program that DOE has for enhancing resilience. That's a, that's a model for how we can have a blended taxpayer and, and ratepayer-funded way to improve resilience. So those types of things are, are in that um, report. And then the third uh, National Academies report I'll mention is uh, the uh, future of uh, electric power uh, report. This came out in February of 2021. I remember that date because that was the same month that uh, Texas had its issues. And so coming out with a grid report that same month was, was kind of interesting. Uh, but one of the things uh, was much broader than resilience in that report. And, and one of the key, um, highlights in that report that, that I'll mention is that when we think about things like competing priorities of the, of the system, like resilience, like affordability, like sustainability and, and low carbon emissions, those, some of those, um, some, sometimes technology can lift all of them, but sometimes you have to make engineering trade-offs. And uh, really having a good decision process for how we're gonna make those trade-offs I think is, is really key. And that ties in very nicely with some of the panels that we had earlier today. So I'll pause here on, on, on the Academy's reports, and maybe I'll have a chance to talk more about some of the things I've done in the past. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Now let's move on. Maria, you are, I mean, Inish and I always talk about your wonderful and great product of Inish's team. And the full disclosure, and she was an Inish PhD student and working together on many topics you heard. <laughs> Uh, this morning, and more importantly, you know, when, when Secretary George Schultz here, he always encouraged the partnership between the MIT and the Stanford, right? Can you share with us, uh, more than that, you're also uh, leading a, a community organization, the Climate Change AI, really answer some of the questions the audience asking, how the data science AI can help support these energy transitions, bring the equity resilience into the formula. You know, can you share with us the work that uh, you have been doing, MIT has been doing, and the uh, Climate Change AI, CCAI has been doing? 
Absolutely, yeah. So I also brought some notes. So um, the MIT team on the Ernest Project is made up of um, kind of seven uh, faculty members and their respective postdocs and students, who I think, are, are really just excited to bring a lot of past work on kind of open source metrics and open source tools to bear on this project. And so um, one of those sort of sets of tools is um, uh, tools to actually help us understand um, at a more kind of spatially granular level what the emissions impacts are of kind of using an additional unit of electricity on the power grid, but kind of even going further from that, what are the societal damages associated with that? So when we think about things like the social cost of carbon, but also things like what are the impacts on people's health and uh, kind of well-being that come from, for example, pollution effects. How do we actually get tools to allow us to quantify what's going on on the grid with respect to that today? Um, and understand then what the kind of benefits are associated with transitioning to kind of better strategies for grid management. And so some of this work on what are called marginal emissions factors and marginal damage factors and trying to calculate them from, uh, for historically for the US grid is uh, work that Inesh, myself, and many others uh, have been working on and are also, I think, have been really built upon by, I think Inesh shared earlier, um, the work from herself, Jacques Chalander, Sally Benson on kind of real-time estimates of, of, of emissions um, on the grid today. So I think really having these tools to really quantify emissions and damages from grids is gonna be really important to, to provide a baseline for what's happening today um, and how we kind of change those emissions and damage-related effects going forward. Um, in addition, so I think, you know, Jeff gave a really great um, kind of overview of the kinds of ways we need to think about resilience and re reliability on the grid. And um, I think there's been a lot of great work there, but I think, as, as Jeff pointed out, I think a lot of concreteness needed additionally in the types of ways that we, we measure and benchmark these things and um, think about also the, you know, the contextual factors and the locational factors associated with them. So, you know, several, uh, faculty members at MIT, Maria Illish, Saura Bamin, Jessica Transic, have looked at different aspects of trying to come up with metrics for this. So for example, when we do have to make hard trade-offs about you know, reliability in different places, can we come up with differentiated reliability of service metrics that take into account conversations with communities about things like the needed level of reliability, sort of willingness to pay and equity-related considerations? Um, can we think about metrics that stem from quote unquote like attacker defender framework? So really an understanding of if you if something happens on the grid, what is your recovery strategy and what is the cost of that recovery strategy? And how do you incorporate that understanding into your, your notion of kind of what the cost of, of reliability or resilience is? Um, and then also as we start to plug in things like you know electric vehicles to the power grid. What do we need to think about? What do we need to think about with respect to the quality of service to the electric vehicles or the effects of those electric vehicles on things like peak demand or solar curtailment or other kinds of things on the grid? So really trying to think through those metrics. So there are really a lot of angles to this. And so I think there's a lot of kind of prior work to bring to bear on how you actually think about kind of uh, writing down um, the different axes of effects you need to think about and actually quantifying these. And then in addition to metrics, right, there's a whole focus in this consortium on, on the actual open source tools and decision support systems that we can use to actually make progress on, on addressing some of these issues. And so the MIT team has definitely brought um, in kind of a lot of prior work on just sort of open source tools that try to model not just the electricity grid, but also kind of how the grid interacts with other systems like natural gas or hydrogen or carbon or you know, various other things that we need to think about um, in order to bring this forth. And so work from you know, uh, Darek Malapragada, Saura Bameen, Maria Illich um, looks at, um, and Jesse Jenkins at Princeton, also part of the consortium, looks at providing tools like GenX for power system modeling or Dolphin for power hydrogen coupling or modeling liquid fuels or JPONG for power gas or um, dynamic monitoring and decision systems to, to couple between the sort of planning and operations and power grid, sort of all this like suite of tools that I think we can really bring together um, and also potentially augmented by machine Machine learning, given that as you start to bring together all these different systems and model systems at much larger scale, you start to be faced with really large scale optimization problems that you have to resolve. And so how do you use machine learning or other tools to try to solve those faster? Um, and the last thing I'll bring up is um, work from uh, Christoph Reinhardt at MIT on the buildings side of things. So again, this consortium is looking not just at the bulk power system, but 
microgrids and also buildings and how they all interact with each other. Um, and so um, uh, Christoph has previously put out uh, UBEM.io, kind of urban building energy model, which you can really start to think about, you know, how do you simulate how buildings are actually um, operating in a city and how do you use that for urban planning or to, for the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions or building level strategies and coupling buildings with grids. So I think there's some really cool tools here that I think we're, we're excited to pull together for this. Wonderful, thank you Priya. Yeah. Uh, Jim, so Priya talked about AI to accelerate optimization, simulation. I remember last time we worked together, it's almost like a 10, probably more than 10, dozen years ago, right? We worked on the high performance computing machine, how we can speed up time domain simulation in fast and real time, in you know, a wonderful work. Uh, so you have been in, in the United States, because in the United States, we do not have a national transmission plan. You know, I mean, uh, I think Jeff may comment on later more on that. And in this country, you have been in the academic world, really promote the concept of microgrid interregional transmission, uh, this kind of things. So can you share with us the recent work you have done in this area, and also the Iowa State the Power Engineering Program, and also maybe, maybe other consortiums you have been involved? Yep, thank you. It was a, a pleasure to hear uh, both of you talk, uh, and I look forward to, to your comments as well, Ram. Uh, I actually am very pleased to be uh, back here in the Bay Area because I spent five years in the 80s uh, working as a transmission planning engineer for PG&E, uh, one California street next to the Embarcadero there, so I love the area and uh, really am glad to, to be back here. And it was really there that I started learning and understanding, you know, I was a very young engineer, 20-something uh, years old at the time, uh, what uh, reliability evaluation looks like, uh, transmission planning, generation planning, the integration of the two, uh, and uh, resilience wasn't a word then, right? We didn't really understand that uh, as, a, as a contextual way to think about the kind of work that uh, we were doing. I've, had a really uh, excellent opportunities since that time. Um, I left PG&E in 1990, went back and got my uh, uh, doctorate, and, and then I uh, moved to Iowa State University, where I am now, uh, in 1992, and have been there uh, ever since. I'm an Iowan uh, now, and uh, uh, glad, to, glad to be that. Um, but I've had the opportunity to look at uh, extreme events in a few different ways. Uh, the first, if you remember, uh, almost 20 years ago now, uh, the Katrina Rita hurricanes that really destroyed the Gulf Coast in all sorts of ways uh, that you know, took six, uh, six weeks really just to bring customers back. Uh, and uh, uh, more importantly, what I learned in, in, in that extreme event uh, was that it's not just about customer interruptions. It's not just about bringing uh, the distribution system back, although it is that. But there's another dimension for many of these events, not all of them, but many of these ex extreme events in the sense that it has a long, it can have a long-term impact on the wholesale price of energy. And what we learned from Katrina Rita, because if you remember, it took out <clears throat> about 80% of that Gulf Coast gas supply and at the time, we didn't have hydraulic fracturing, so most of the U.S. gas came from the Gulf. And almost overnight, we lost 80% of that supply. And so all of the gas utilizing utilities in the United States felt that. And the subsequent Im impact on the electric prices were also observable. And not just for a few weeks, or a few months, but for almost a year, it was incredible. And what we were seeing was 10, 15% increase in the wholesale price of electricity throughout the United States. It, sometimes 5% in certain places in, in the Northeast, it was higher uh, and so forth. So um, this kind of uh, uh, impact, this kind of sequence of impacts uh, and the, the way resilient high extreme events can propagate through our society is, is a really complicated but important you know, feature to understand. On the other side of that coin, I was sitting in my office in 2020 uh, in Ames, Iowa, uh, about 9 a.m., and it was a beautiful day. And I looked out my window an hour and a half later, and it was pitch black. Go figure, 
I didn't know what I didn't know what the world. I, I thought I was in World War III, I, and it was worse. Uh, but but uh, we had what we call now a derecho, uh, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and within a half hour, the the town in which I live was was really destroyed. Um, I, it, it takes me usually five minutes to get from my office uh, to my car, another five minutes to get home. So you know it's a town of uh, sixty thousand people with the students. <laughs> uh, but that day, it took me an hour to get home because I was having to you know, figure out ways to avoid the trees that had fallen all over the infrastructure. Poles were down, et cetera. Uh, so this was the other extreme, right? We, we, we had a huge impact on our distribution system. And I would offer that these two dimensions, you know, the impact on wholesale prices and the impact on customer interruptions at the distribution level are two reasonable ways to sort of think about these extreme events that we, that we tend to worry about when we look at uh, resilience. Um, so um, maybe I'll, I'll kind of stop there. It, it, one more comment, and uh, uh, Liang mentioned it. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work uh, over the past really 15 years on thinking about what I refer to as multi-regional transmission. So you've heard of intra-regional transmission. That's what all the R RTOs do, and they do it very well. Uh, and then, you know, since FERC Order 1000, I think we've been hearing about intra, excuse me, inter-regional transmission, right, between the regions, between uh, PJM and, and uh, MISO, between SPP and, and MISO. Uh, and the, the, the real interesting feature that, I, that I've been working on that I think we're just starting really to think about in a serious way is multi-regional transmission. And I would offer that we're already, you know, in some sense, making those designs when we build the infrastructure or when we design the transmission infrastructure for the East Coast wind offshore and the West Coast wind offshore. These are inter-regional transmission grids when you look at those pictures of people's designs. Um, and now all we got to do is really connect the midsection. Mid so uh, hopefully I'll have a little bit more time to, think, uh, to talk to you about uh, multi-regional transmission as we go through the, the panel discussion here today. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Jim. Next, uh, but not least, is, uh, is my colleague uh, and actually partner in crime with Inesh and I, Ram Rajakoba. We co-directed the Bits and Watch Initiative, and, uh, which uh, laid down the foundation for many of the things uh, we are doing here. And uh, uh, Arun mentioned during his opening remark this morning a lot of wonderful work you and Arun have partnered together regarding the you know, mm -hmm. deep solar, the, the side to -side calculations, and the underground the efforts. So can you elaborate a little bit more the work you have been done in the last several years, you know, really help lay down the foundations for the earnest? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the basic principle of the work we have been doing here, and, and the we here is a collective, Liang, Yinez, myself, Arun, uh, starts with the acknowledgement that traditionally infrastructure design is a supply and demand problem solved from the top down. You aggregate all the demand that you have, you have a criteria that you need to meet it with a certain you know, likelihood or probability, and you build enough supply to, to, to match that. And then um, as things happen in a large scale, you know, it gets distributed spatially across a, a region. But as we start to look into the grid today and the issues that we are all facing, there is concerns about communities, individuals, people. And when you start to take a closer look at the grid and try to understand from a perspective of a community, what does resilience mean? What does reliability mean? Um, <clears throat> we discover that we lack a few things. First, we lack tools that help you map what resources these communities have deployed. How has different policies affected adoption patterns of different technologies, for example, solar, storage, etc. Second, we need tools to project and understand what's the reliability at this local level. And how is, does it get affected by different events, your climate events? And then third is this influence of climate itself. How does it happen in infrastructure? Well, traditional climate data is not really prepared to be combined with infrastructure analysis. So you need to figure that piece out. 
So what we try to do at Stanford is create tools that we have released in the open source, uh, both the results and outputs of our tool, as well as the tools itself, so that anybody can reproduce what we have done, to actually close these gaps. So it ranges from things like being able to map all the solar panels in the United States and the date of their installation, um, like uh, Rune mentioned this morning, uh, down to what is the largest, it will be the largest reliability database for the United States where we have accumulated not just the federal data that's available, but one of my students went and collected every possible record from libraries, public sources, calling utilities, and built out the longest time series of reliability on every county in the United States. And what we'll say, well, why do I need that? Well, if you want to understand, for example, climate resiliency, these are rare events. I do need long records to start to understand that. So that that's kind of has been the driving principle, this community-based thinking. and. We then close the loop by looking at a few opportunities. One is we have done surveys with actual communities in work that, that Inez has done and also a researcher from my lab, June Flora, where we found out combining the you know, smart meter data plus our weather indicators and survey responses what is the actual impact of climate events on people? Um, do people actually care for electricity being super reliable? And to my surprise, actually, most people are okay if like a few hours during the year you ran out of electricity. Yes, it's upsetting. Uh, the, the real issue starts when it's, it's multiple hours, multiple days, and, and things like that. And, and I think that's a change in perspective of how we design the grid. Because if you think there is a single reliability that applies to everybody, or if you ask people in these communities, what is the value of electricity to you economically? What's the value of loss load? They can't come up with, with these numbers. They don't know what reliability they need. They don't know the value of loss load. But they know the experiences they can have. So kind of starting to close the loop through the survey mechanisms and figuring out how to incorporate them into engineering design and optimization. And then going all the way to microgrids. And we have, I think, Dan Sambor, if he's still here, where we tend to think, yeah, it'll be great if we can all you know, operate off-grid. The reality of it is, if you look at adoption of technology right now, the wealthiest people can operate off-grid. The poorest people are more and more dependent on the grid. And so on average, maybe you are improving, but if you look at a community level, you may not be improving. And how could you mitigate that? So then you have to start thinking about what policies are actually working. And we find, for example, commercial solar works to close this equity gap. And what if you know, commercial sites could offer microgrids that connect it to the communities around? These are the kind of questions we want to be able to answer in earnest, is integrating tools from multiple areas, taking a community perspective, and coming up with actionable insights. That's the basic goal. Wonderful. If I, if I allow them to talk, they can spend the rest of 25 minutes to all talk <laughs> about history, right? But we need to look forward. Yes. So Ernest has five goals. In the last almost like two hours, and we spent a lot of time deep dive into the pilots. That's one of the goals. You know, we try to replicate, model, develop rapid model, be able to do the regional province, the, the, the islands province, and the city province. <laughs> and uh, the first goal we have for Ernest is establish the baseline matrix for resilience, for emission, and for equity. That's the first goal we have. The second goal we have for the Ernest is develop open source US North America open version modeling database and the tools. So you heard the wonderful work done by multiple organizations, more than just four of them here, but also other 12 universities uh, represent in this room. So I will start with Jeff, then we go this order. Can you share with us, based on the his historical work, how you think about earnest can help achieve the two goals we talk about here? The matrix and also the open source model and the tools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
on the metric side, um, as, as everybody's been pointing out, there's, there's some interesting work that started, but we're not there yet in terms of really having uh, widely adopted, firmly established metrics for resilience. The reliability metrics are pretty good, but the resilience metrics have ways to go. And as part of the original uh, grid modernization initiative uh, that was started about 10 years ago, uh, there was uh, some projects looking at developing a, a framework for, for developing metrics. And one of the things that was clear for resilience metrics is you'd have to model those and simulate them. You can't wait until these events have occurred to, to measure your resilience. You have to do some predictive analytics to, to understand uh, how your system is going to be resilient before the big event happens that you're planning for. You know, so it's really more about preparedness and, and what the system's going to do in response to different hazards. And so that was one of the, the grid modernization laboratory consortium projects, uh, you know, multi multi-lab team there on that. Um, and, and that ties in very closely with the modeling. And so NARM that J, JP talked about earlier, uh, but some of the other co-simulation tools like Helix being able to bring together uh, different domains and do co-simulation. That was also supported uh, by DOE on the uh, Grid Modernization Lab Consortium. And, and the current round of, of how this, this DOE program is, is morphing is, is the, the Grid Modernization Initiative has been recently reformed. Uh, there's a new set of task teams. There's a summit in Washington, D.C. next week. I'm not really advertising it because the registration is full. So if you're not already signed up, sorry. Um, but that's going to be a, a sort of an event to really kick off the, the new um, DOE GMI vision. We're developing a technical roadmap. And there's also a pretty large uh, cybersecurity part of that summit as well. Um, but then at this modeling work you know, ties into some other related things that are going on. Um, Liang alluded to, and Jim talked about this multi-regional planning, and there's a current project underway that PNNL and NRL are working together on called the National Transmission Planning Study, and this is really looking at, at uh, continent-wide modeling, um, and the goal is how do we um, leverage transmission to enable more uh, renewables to achieve our, our clean grid goals, right? The, the nation wants to have a decarbonized grid by 2035. And transmission is going to need to be a key part of that because we want to tap into solar in the desert southwest and wind in the in the Midwest and and um, really looking beyond what the FERC Order 1000 regions are doing, looking at it from a, a nation basis. And uh, so that project is combining capacity expansion tools with production cost models and power flow analysis for for doing resilience extreme event analysis and that sort of thing. It's all part of the the DOE uh, Building a Better Grid Initiative through the Grid Deployment Office. Uh, and with, as has been mentioned many times throughout the day, there's, there is a lot of federal funding right now floating around in the system with the bipartisan infrastructure bill and other, other sources of funding. Uh, but that also ties in, so an, another sort of thread I'll pull on that a little bit is how do you validate these models, right? How do we, how do we know, you know, other than waiting around for, for big events to occur? And, and as an industry, um, electric power industry is really is driven by events, right? You've got the 65 blackout had a lot of changes. And, and uh, you know, during my career arc, there's the August 10th, 1996 blackout, which is a big deal. We had the uh, August 14th, 2003 blackout, which is a big deal. Uh, Hurricane Katrina was a big deal. You know, Superstorm Sandy was a big deal. What happened in Puerto Rico was a big deal. What happened in Texas in 2021 was a big deal. So these are, these are things that we respond to reactionarily but there's also ways to validate models without waiting for those things to happen. And, and so one of the other projects I've been involved in in my career is uh, the, related to synchrophasers and the PMUs. In fact, it was pretty cool for me personally when, when uh, Dr. Chu, you know, former Secretary of Energy, pulled out the phaser measurement units as his example of impact from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act from 10 years ago, because uh, that, that was stuff I was working on. And uh, so I've been leading the, the North American Synchrophaser Initiative on behalf of the DOE you know, since, since it started in 2006. And, and the main purpose of that is to gather data on the grid so we can uh, use that information to enhance the accuracy of our, our models. And that, in the early days of, of synchrophasers, that was great when we had a grid that was full of synchronous machines. You're gathering data 30 times a second, it's time synchronized, and you can really do a lot with that and, and analyze the dynamics on the system and oscillations, things like that in the electromechanical realm. But now we have all these inverter-based resources, and they're doing things that are unexpected. You know, we had a, 
the Blue Cut Fire, um, if you've heard of that. That happened here in the you know, desert southwest part of the country. And that was a normally third line line fault that was interpreted by um, inverter-based resources as an over-frequency event. And so they thought they were being good citizens of the grid by curtailing their generation output. That occurred during the time that that fault was being cleared. And again, normally cleared fault, so within a few cycles. That is not what we want on the grid, is to have a line fault followed by a couple, you know, 100 megawatts of, of generation loss. And then, then the same thing happened in Texas, in Odessa. They called it the Odessa event. And then uh, it happened again later, and it was even bigger. And so NERC is really troubled by this trend of having these uh, inverter-based resources not behaving correctly during these transients and faults and things. And so there's a lot of work to be done there in terms of enhancing the models of that. So I'm hoping that you know, Ernest can help contribute to that. I think the collective horsepower of the, um, all the universities and labs that are involved in, in the project can, can you know, dig into aspects of it. But it's, it's bigger than even Ernest can tackle. It's, this is going to be something that the whole industry is going to really uh, have a lot of reckoning to do over the next several years. Priya, can you share some thoughts on the uh, uh, respect of time, be more specific on the, on the emission matrix? Because you know, you've been involved in marginal emissions, you heard from the consumption-based emission this morning, and also the, the open source, because you have been leading a lot of AI open source, and including modeling efforts. Can you share some thoughts of what Ernest can help achieve the goals? Absolutely, and I think like succinctly, I think that the thing that Ernest is really bringing to the table is stakeholder, driven or use-inspired research. In some sense, the mechanics of a lot of what I think we'll be doing as a consortium are similar, right? Trying to make models more granular, trying to connect models up. But the ways in which you do that or the ways in which that's useful, you only really understand that or see that come to bear when you're actually working with the organizations that need to use those models or the end users who will be affected by the consequences of those models. And so I think you, you saw a lot with the pilots before, really like every single pilot had some right end user, had some um, you know, utility or system operator, right? somebody who would be kind of a user of these models. And the goal, I think, is to really stress test these to see how useful they are and to see what technical challenges emerge that we have to address in order to make the models more useful rather than kind of making assumptions based on computational tractability that aren't really reflecting what's going on on the grid or in our building. So succinctly, I really think it is this stakeholder engaged research and the way that really drives us to develop the tools in ways that are going to be useful when, when the rubber hits the road. Good. Let's move on, Jim. I mean, can you share how we can create, because FERC wants out and is really transparency is one of the key components, right? How the open source tools and models can support your vision of a multi-regional connections? Yeah, so uh, to support uh, multi-regional uh, connections as well as really any other kind of solution, I think it's incredibly important to be able to evaluate uh, both the impact of a particular solution on the resilience of the infrastructure, as well as the impact of the particular solution on the normal operation of the infrastructure, right? Because there are indeed some solutions for resilience that don't really contribute to the normal operation of the infrastructure. Case in point, a colleague at Iowa State that I have, a uh, very good colleague, is, has just a wonderful uh, R&D activity building mobile energy systems. Essentially, they're crates on the back of a truck and you know, got uh, a diesel uh, generator with uh, solar and storage. And, and uh, during an event, like I mentioned earlier, uh, where we you know, had our lights out in the course of an hour in, uh, one morning in 2020, uh, you can pull these crates to critical loads and supply them for as long as you need, right? Uh, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity to build in the, uh, r r the minimization of outage time uh, of different loads during an extreme event. But yet, it doesn't do much for the normal operating condition of the infrastructure system. Uh, and, and, and indeed, there's you know, transmission that could be built uh, that would facilitate uh, some kinds of uh, resilience issues as well as normal operations. So looking at the different kinds of impacts of solutions uh, and then having the ability tool-wise to evaluate both sides of that coin, and then from a user point of view, say, you know, I, 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 
I, I can get this much resilience and I can get this much benefit in, in terms of uh, normal operation, and, and what's the trade-off, and can I dial in, you know, kind of a, a, a desire on one side and a desire on the other side and see if I can reach it and, and, and study the, the balance between the two as you probe and, and understand different solutions. I call this a resilience-based capacity expansion planning application. So it focuses on investments, but also has the capability to understand the impact on the infrastructure with respect to resilience kind of solutions. I'll stop there. Good. Ron? And uh, you know, one, one thing I learned from you is really the importance of the communities, right? Anything we produce, whatever equity and resilience has to go down to zip code level and to see really what's the impact to the communities. So can you share some thoughts of regarding the things we produced in the past, how we can help Ernest to achieve the goals we have here? Yeah, I think one of the um, exciting things about Ernest is that by integrating the, the, our ability to produce analysis, simulations, and uh, uh, optimization, at this much more granular level, um, we, we, we can now integrate that picture into what some of the other speakers have talked about, which is there is a traditional process for capacity expansion planning. There is ways in which people design microgrids. That's kind of the existing practice. So how do we connect this more higher resolution data and the insights we get out of it and plug it into these tools that, that do the tasks that you know, we, we have essentially, in a way, standardized on in the past. And I think the other aspect that I think is super exciting is it's not just about resilient, a resilient grid. We are also talking about a decarbonized grid. And having these two goals in mind at the same time, I think is very challenging. And it's not something that we have really put our heads together to think about how to achieve that. And I think that is also very, very exciting. And I believe our um, more increased resolution modeling can help us understand that. OK, before I switch the gear to the other goals, I want to make a stop here and see any question you may have from the audience regarding the, the baseline matrix, resilience, resilience, uh, resilience emissions, and the equity, and also the open source model and data sets. Hello. Hi. I have a question. So we talked about um, increasing spatial resolution to get location-specific results. How do you balance that with also the need for long temporal data sets to get those extreme events? Because usually in models, those are kind of, you either do high spatial resolution or long data. So I'm just curious, um, in the open models, how we we'll balance those? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a great observation. And, and the models are really tuned for you know, usually a specific uh, niche of, of the system. And the grid itself is it's an amazing system because it, at the you know, temporal scale, we're doing things at the planning level where we're trying to figure out wh what to build over the next 20 years, all the way down to you know, within a cycle, you know, for protection and control types of things, right? And, and everything in between in terms of the temporal. And then on the spatial, we've got continent-wide models where you're modeling like the whole interconnected system. And sometimes, you know, um, like for the National Transmission Planning State, we got west and east together because we're modeling, you know, the economics of DC ties between them. And, and so really, truly continent-wide things all the way down to when you're, you know, really needing to figure out a microgrid, you, you know, you're in buildings and things. Um, so it's, it's a great question. I'm not going to have a, a crisp answer for you, but um, one of the things that, one of the strategies that we've taken in, in projects like Helix and ARM, for example, is that we don't want to necessarily um, try to do too much by putting all of that, you know, very widely spatial data and very, you know, disparate temporal data into one model and trying to make sense of it. What we want to do is take these various tools that are really optimized for a slice of that, but then build um, the boundary conditions so we can do co-simulation and, and build, you know, do that simulation framework so we can leverage each of these 
very individualized tools that's studying a piece of the problem, but then depending on the scope of what you're trying to answer, link that to the other tools that are, that are adjacent to it, and then um, through better modeling of those boundary conditions, you know, really, really enhance on that. And one example of a boundary condition is between transmission and distribution, right? So historically, for you know, most of the existence of the grid, <clears throat> the distribution system, all it needs to know, all it needs to have is, is voltage and frequency at the, at the substation, right? And then the, the designer and, and opter, operator of the distribution system will take care of all the protection controls along the feeder, right? But there's really just, they just expect to have the voltage and frequency within tolerance at the, at the feeder. And, and what might happen on that distribution system that could reflect back into the transmission system is something that, you know, is just very limited, like some demand response programs and things like that. But with the advent of more distributed generation on the feeders and the ability to actually have flow coming back into the transmission from the distribution, you know, and that might change throughout the day depending on, you know, what's going on with solar and things like that, it, it really needs, you need to have that co-simulation there. To, to model those those boundary conditions. So hopefully that answered your question. Anyone else want to respond to this question? Quickly, I'd use the word decomposition, not only from a formal optimization point of view, but also from a sort of manual modeling point of view where you use different models in a manually decomposed way. I think both are applicable here to some of the comments Jeff made. I was gonna say, I think we have another question in the audience in case we want, if we, if we have time for it. Okay, we have another question, let's go. Oh, and there too. Oh, <laughs> so many. This way. <laughs> well, let's rotate. Uh, that's one from Princeton. So it's a continuation of the previous question, actually. So how uh, we are going to bring this climate modeling and the energy modeling community together uh, mm -hmm. addressing this issue. For example, if you consider the climate community, so the spatial resolution that they model is like usually pretty large, maybe like one month or one year resolution. And as energy community, we typically need, for example, capacity expansion mode, like one hour resolution. And, and at the same time, if you consider like the distribution grid, so we need like much finer spatial resolution, which we do not usually get uh, with the climate models. So yeah. any insights on how we kind of like bring these two communities together, climate modeling and, uh, and systems or uh, distribution or transmission or any other communities together addressing this question. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, oh, um, and yeah, and I, let's try to have okay. a Priya answer this one, okay. and uh, move on. Then run. everybody has a chance to respond to one of the questions. Great. So I, I think what I'll, I'll say really briefly is there's there's actually some really exciting work trying to use um, machine learning to downscale the outputs of climate models, which are often really coarse spatial resolution, to the spatial the, the more granular spatial resolution we need to kind of model impacts on power infrastructure. And in summary, how it basically works is that if you run a climate model on what kind of the climate model would say happens today or in the past, you take the more granular weather data about the present we have now, you can learn some kind of mapping between the kind of coarse spatial output of the climate model and the finer grained weather data we have. Um, and the hope, the goal, is that when you then like create a climate projection in the future, that that same mapping between the coarse output that the climate model is giving you and the fine-grained kind of weather implication in a particular place that that implies remain roughly consistent. And there's a lot of work to be done to kind of make that, that better, but I, I think that this is um, a really promising approach for trying to bring those two communities together. Okay, let's move to this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about baselining of metrics. So resiliency, equity, decarbonization, and uh, reliability. These are important metrics. If one assumes that they are functions to be learned from observable data, and we understand they are context-dependent, community-driven, and depend on the level of abstraction. We just want a clarification. Are we thinking about the functions learned individually, or are this, is, is this the goal is to sort of learn the function jointly, which means should the equity and decarbonization be learned jointly, or is there a merit to sort of tease out the um, differences uh, between them and define them individually. So I think this is an important question about baseline. So any clarifications on that? Let me, maybe you haven't answered any questions. So I think uh, you've done, yeah, you done research before <laughs> on this topic. Let's, yeah. let's. No, so I think very naturally these things are correlated with each other. So I think very naturally these things are correlated with each other. Um, reliability is about the availability of power when you need it. So, you know, and 
resiliency is your kind of capacity to recover from events. Now, obviously, certain technologies will afford a certain reliability and a certain capacity to recover. And similarly, I think equity then brings the interplay between policy, economics, pricing models, and then technology as well. And um, I think the other factor you mentioned was uh, decarbonization. I think that that's the overarching principle in earnest is VR on a march towards decarbonization. So these analyses have to be done into that context. Now, when you say, how do you learn this jointly or separately? I, I think there is several steps even before getting there. The first one is kind of defining what is the this? How do we measure these four dimensions properly? And then second, of course, how do you, how do you learn it? And I think it's going to depend on the scale and the combination of tools. Um, I think that's part of what we need to discover with Ernest, because there is no, I would say, clear-cut standard today on how to do this. Wonderful. Let's move on. And uh, we have about uh, three or five minutes. Let's uh, do a little bit of rapid fire. We still have, have two questions haven't discussed, and uh, one is the workforce. Yesterday, uh, many of you were there. It, uh, out of my expectation, it's almost become a recruiting event among different government agencies. So we see the huge needs more than just a resilient system, but also resilient and skilled workforce. I want each of you have a very quick 30 seconds to respond. What's, as a research, as a, as a university or national lab, how you respond to industry and the government needs regarding the workforce for these energy transitions? Let's start with this side, with Ram, Jim, Perea, and Jeff. Um, I think as a university, you respond in, in, in three ways. First, the students we produce, they can work in the government, but they can also be excellent interns. Second, the classes and the materials that we are creating, making them open and accessible to everyone so that others can build this capability of training the workforce based on what we're doing. And third, and I, th I think this is also super important, is those out here at Stanford have the ability to go and advocate for resources to be put into the development of this workforce. We hear this all the time, that this is super essential, and Stanford is not going to train every single person that does that. So, But we can definitely advocate for more to be put towards this. Jim? I want to say coordinated internships is a really good idea. What I mean, what I mean by that is when you have a PhD student, three years, four years, five years, depending on many factors, uh, that's enough time to have at least one internship, and I would argue two, if they're three or four months each, right? And then you're investing six, seven, eight months, maybe a year at the most, of that student's time in the internship, and, and have two opportunities, not just one, uh, so that you can, the individual can compare and contrast the different cultures, the different people, the different networks of those organizations. Even better, make one of them an engineering-oriented kind of experience, and the other one uh, a social-slash-regulatory kind of experience. Uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, if I could have my way, let my PhD student spend three months at the Iowa Utility Board under Josh Burns, who spoke earlier today, and then another three months at MISO and then come back to me and do the greatest PhD dissertation ever. <laughs> I would add one more, more than just PhD students, right? master's students, undergraduates, that's what we are doing here, Stanford. We send the students to, to ISO, send students to the PUCs, California Air Resource Board, even Alaska. <laughs> For real? Um, in addition to those things, uh, I think many universities also have professional education programs where industry will come explicitly to the university to get education on these topics. And I think that there can be a lot done to make sure that entities, um, for example, working in needing to decarbonize right, energy systems, but also entities that have less financial resources to pay into these uh, systems traditionally, I think there's a lot that can be done to try to expand the reach of these programs to, to those kinds of entities. So PNNL, just like all the other national labs, has a pretty strong internship program. In fact, I started with that route. Um, and then uh, we also uh, have a partnership with uh, Washington State University called the Advanced Grid Institute. And uh, part of that is, is very heavily focused on workforce development. We have uh, something called a district, Distinguished Graduate Research Program, where uh, in that case, it's PhD students would start off their first two years at the university and their second two years at the National Lab 
for a four-year program. And, uh, and then for on-the-job training for people in the utility industry, a lot of my projects over the years have had uh, training and, and, and workforce development as part of it. So for example, in NASPE, uh, we've done some training programs for system operators to better understand how to use this wide area time synchronized measurement for better uh, operational decision making and enhance situational awareness. So we'll do tutorials and training things that are focused on utility people. Wonderful. Uh, last but the most important goal for uh, Ernest is really how to engage underrepresented communities. You know, we have been discussed this for the whole day, starting from the first panel today. So I want to give each of you like 10 seconds, very quick uh, closing remark, share your thoughts, how to engage underrepresented communities. Let's start from Jeff and go back to Ron. Yeah, these pilot projects that uh, were briefed today, and I don't even know if that's the whole list. I mean, there's a lot of pilot projects part of Ernest. Uh, really fantastic opportunities that where engagement of these communities is, is very central and key. And I also think this is something that's pervasive across many other DOE programs, you know, in terms of a real emphasis on that, um, you know, in terms of really engaging the, uh, the, the broader stakeholder community, including uh, disadvantaged communities. Yeah, I think we definitely have a huge responsibility as a consortium to kind of view both studied expertise and lived expertise as first class citizens and really make sure that they both are brought to the table in the way we're conducting these projects. And I think this is a really huge focus in the way we're, we're going to try to move forward on these projects. I don't know the word, but I'm, I'm thinking of the following. Uh, don't laugh at me. Techno, economic, environmental, social engineering. Uh, I don't know if I got everything there, but you know, you listen to us. We're talking about complicated engineering processes and methods, uh, and we're talking about the community and what is the community exactly, uh, underrepresented, et cetera, right? It's big, it's huge, it's large. Uh, quick uh, story, I was at a, a, a MISO meeting recently with 346 uh, participants. They call them stakeholders not MISO folks. In the MISO, there's five MISO engineers that are presenting the essence of their long-range transmission planning results. They do this every six weeks for three hours. I just want to make the case that we're just beginning to learn how to do that. We got a long way to go on stakeholder enga engagement. Well, um, I think in several levels, first of all, recruiting students to work on earnest who are from underrepresented communities. I think that's kind of a duty that we have if you want to address this issue. Second, making sure that our students, uh, when they focus on these problems, actually work with the community, actually engage, going beyond the campus boundaries and um, actively being involved. And third, I also think there's a lot of output from earnest that will be able to influence policy. And I think that's another avenue to, to address these inequity issues. With that, I would like to conclude this session. And I uh, would like to thank Jeff, Priya, Jim, and Ram share with us the wonderful work have been done and also look forward to what we are going to do for the earnest. Appreciate it. Thank you.